This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus. The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Volume 4, Chapter 6. Ye gods of quiet and of sleep profound, whose soft dominion over this castle sways, and all the widely silent places round. Forgive me if my trembling pen displays what never yet was sung in mortal lays. Thompson The Count gave orders for the North Apartments to be opened and prepared for the reception of Lodovico. But Dorothy, remembering what she had lately witnessed there, feared to obey, and, not one of the other servants daring to venture thither, the rooms remained shut up till the time when Ludovico was to retire thither for the night, an hour for which the whole household waited with impatience. After supper Ludovico, by the order of the Count, attended him in his closet, where they remained alone for near half an hour, and, on leaving which, his lord delivered to him a sword. "'It has seen service in mortal quarrels,' said the Count jocosely. You will use it honourably, no doubt, in a spiritual one. Tomorrow let me hear that there is not one ghost remaining in the chateau. Ludovico received it with a respectful bow. You shall be obeyed, my lord, said he. I will engage that no spectre shall disturb the peace of the chateau after this night. They now returned to the supper-room, where the Count's guests awaited to accompany him and Ludovico to the door of the north apartments and dorothy being summoned for the keys delivered them to ludovico who then led the way followed by most of the inhabitants of the chateau having reached the back staircase several of the servants shrunk back and refused to go further but the rest followed him to the top of the staircase where a broad landing place allowed them to flock round him while he applied the key to the door during which they watched him with as much eager curiosity as if he had been performing some magical rite. Ludovico, unaccustomed to the lock, could not turn it, and Dorothy, who had lingered far behind, was called forward, under whose hand the door opened slowly, and, her eye glancing within the dusky chamber, she uttered a sudden shriek and retreated. At this signal of alarm, the greater part of the crowd, hurried down the stairs, and the Count, Henry, and Ludovico were left alone to pursue the inquiry, who instantly rushed into the apartment, Ludovico with a drawn sword, which he had just time to draw from the scabbard, the Count with the lamp in his hand, and Henry carrying a basket containing provisions for the courageous adventurer. Having looked hastily round the first room, where nothing appeared to justify alarm, they passed on to the second and here too all being quiet they proceeded to a third with a more tempered step the count had now leisure to smile at the discomposure into which he had been surprised and to ask ludovico in which room he designed to pass the night there are several chambers beyond these your excellency said ludovico pointing to a door and in one of them is a bed they say i will pass the night there and when i am weary of watching I can lie down. Good, said the Count. Let us go on. You see, these rooms shew nothing but damp walls and decaying furniture. I have been so much engaged since I came to the chateau that I have not looked into them till now. Remember, Ludovico, to tell the housekeeper tomorrow to throw open these windows. The damask hangings are dropping to pieces. I will have them taken down and this antique furniture removed. "'Dear sir,' said Henry, "'here is an armchair so massy with gilding "'that it resembles one of the state chairs at the Louvre "'more than anything else.' "'Yes,' said the Count, stopping a moment to survey it. "'There is a history belonging to that chair, "'but I have not time to tell it. "'Let us pass on. "'This suit runs to a greater extent than I had imagined. "'It is many years since I was in them.' But where is the bedroom you speak of, Ludovico? These are only antechambers to the great drawing-room. I remember them in their splendour. 
the bed my lord replied ludovico they told me was in a room that opens beyond the saloon and terminates the suite oh here is the saloon said the count as they entered the spacious apartment in which emily and dorothy had rested he here stood for a moment surveying the relics of faded grandeur which it exhibited the sumptuous tapestry the long and low sofas of velvet with frames heavily carved and gilded the floor inlaid with small squares of fine marble and covered in the centre with a piece of very rich tapestry work the casements of painted glass and the large venetian mirrors of a size and quality such as at that period france could not make which reflected on every side the spacious apartment these had formerly also reflected a gay and brilliant scene for this had been the state room of the chateau and here the marchioness had held the assemblies that made part of the festivities of her nuptials if the wand of a magician could have recalled the vanished groups many of them vanished even from the earth that once had passed over these polished mirrors what a varied and contrasted picture would they have exhibited with the present now instead of a blaze of lights and a splendid and busy crowd they reflected only the rays of the one glimmering lamp which the count held up and which scarcely served to shew the three forlorn figures that stood surveying the room and the spacious and dusky walls around them ah said the count to henry awaking from his deep reverie how the scene has changed since last i saw it i was a young man then and the marchioness was alive and in her bloom many other persons were here too who are now no more there stood the orchestra here we tripped in many a sprightly maze the walls echoing to the dance now they resound only one feeble voice and even that will here long be heard no more my son remember that i was once as young as yourself and that you must pass away like those who have preceded you like those who as they sung and danced in this once gay apartment forgot that years are made up of moments and that every step they took carried them nearer to their graves but such reflections are useless i had almost said criminal unless they teach us to prepare for eternity since otherwise they cloud our present happiness without guiding us to a future one but enough of this let us go on ludovico now opened the door of the bedroom and the count as he entered was struck with the funeral appearance which the dark arras gave to it he approached the bed with an emotion of solemnity and perceiving it to be covered with the pall of black velvet paused what can this mean said he as he gazed upon it i have heard my lord said ludovico as he stood at the feet looking within the canopied curtains that the lady marchioness de villeroy died in this chamber and remained here till she was removed to be buried and this perhaps signor may account for the pall the count made no reply but stood for a moment engaged in thought and evidently much affected then turning to ludovico he asked him with a serious air whether he thought his courage would support him through the night if you doubt this added the count do not be ashamed to own it i will release you from your engagement without exposing you to the triumphs of your fellow servants ludovico paused pride and something very like fear seemed struggling in his breast pride however was victorious he blushed and his hesitation ceased no my lord said he i will go through with what i have begun and i am grateful for your consideration on that hearth i will make a fire and with the good cheer in this basket i doubt not i shall do well be it so said the count but how will you beguile the tediousness of the night if you do not sleep when i am weary my lord replied ludovico i shall not fear to sleep in the meanwhile i have a book that will entertain me well said the count i hope nothing will disturb you but if you should be seriously alarmed in the night come to my apartment i have too much confidence in your good sense and courage to believe you will be alarmed on slight grounds or suffer the gloom of this chamber 
or its remote situation to overcome you with ideal terrors tomorrow i shall have to thank you for an important service these rooms shall then be thrown open and my people will be convinced of their error good night ludovico let me see you early in the morning and remember what i lately said to you i will my lord good night to your excellency let me attend you with the light he lighted the count and henry through the chambers to the outer door on the landing place stood a lamp which one of the affrighted servants had left and henry as he took it up again bade ludovico good night who having respectfully returned the wish closed the door upon them and fastened it then as he retired to the bedchamber he examined the rooms through which he passed with more minuteness than he had done before for he apprehended that some person might have concealed himself in them for the purpose of frightening him no one however but himself was in these chambers and leaving open the doors through which he passed he came again to the great drawing-room whose spaciousness and silent gloom somewhat awed him for a moment he stood looking back through the long suite of rooms he had quitted and as he returned perceiving a light and his own figure reflected in one of the large mirrors he started other objects too were seen obscurely on its dark surface but he paused not to examine them and returned hastily into the bedroom as he surveyed which he observed the door of the oriel and opened it all within was still on looking round his eye was arrested by the portrait of the deceased marchioness upon which he gazed for a considerable time with great attention and some surprise and then having examined the closet he returned into the bedroom where he kindled a wood fire the bright blaze of which revived his spirits which had begun to yield to the gloom and silence of the place for gusts of wind alone broke at intervals this silence he now drew a small table and a chair near the fire took a bottle of wine and some cold provisions out of his basket and regaled himself when he had finished his repast he laid his sword upon the table and not feeling disposed to sleep drew from his pocket the book he had spoken of it was a volume of old provencal tales having stirred the fire upon the hearth he began to read and his attention was soon wholly occupied by the scenes which the page disclosed the count meanwhile had returned to the supper room whither those of the party who had attended him to the north apartment had retreated upon hearing dorothy's scream and who were now earnest in their inquiries concerning those chambers the count rallied his guests on their precipitate retreat and on the superstitious inclination which had occasioned it and this led to the question whether the spirit after it has quitted the body is ever permitted to revisit the earth and if it is whether it was possible for spirits to become visible to the sense the baron was of opinion that the first was probable and the last was possible and he endeavoured to justify this opinion by respectable authorities both ancient and modern which he quoted the count however was decidedly against him and a long conversation ensued in which the usual arguments on these subjects were on both sides brought forward with skill and discussed with candour but without converting either party to the opinion of his opponent the effect of their conversation on their auditors was various though the count had much the superiority of the baron in point of argument he had considerably fewer adherents for that love so natural to the human mind of whatever is able to distend its faculties with wonder and astonishment attached the majority of the company to the side of the baron and though many of the count's propositions were unanswerable his opponents were inclined to believe this the consequence of their own want of knowledge on so abstracted a subject rather than that arguments did not exist which were forcible enough to conquer his blanche was pale with attention till the ridicule in her father's glance called a blush upon her countenance and she then endeavoured to forget the superstitious tales she had been told in her convent meanwhile emily had been listening with deep attention to the discussion of what was to her a very interesting question 
and remembering the appearance she had witnessed in the apartment of the late marchioness she was frequently chilled with awe several times she was on the point of mentioning what she had seen but the fear of giving pain to the count and the dread of his ridicule restrained her and awaiting in anxious expectation the event of ludovico's intrepidity she determined that her future silence should depend upon it when the party had separated for the night and the count retired to his dressing-room the remembrance of the desolate scenes he had lately witnessed in his own mansion deeply affected him but at length he was aroused from his reverie and his silence what music is that i hear said he suddenly to his valet who plays it at this late hour the man made no reply and the count continued to listen and then added that is no common musician he touches the instrument with a delicate hand who is it pierre my lord said the man hesitatingly who plays that instrument repeated the count does not your lordship know then said the valet what mean you said the count somewhat sternly nothing my lord i meant nothing rejoined the man submissively only that music goes about the house at midnight often and i thought your lordship might have heard it before music goes about the house at midnight poor fellow does nobody dance to the music too it is not in the chateau i believe my lord the sounds come from the woods they say though they seem so near but then a spirit can do anything ah poor fellow said the count i perceive you are as silly as the rest of them tomorrow you will be convinced of your ridiculous error but hark what voice is that oh my lord that is the voice we often hear with the music often said the count how often pray it's a very fine one why my lord i myself have not heard it more than two or three times but there are those who have lived here longer they have heard it often enough what a swell was that exclaimed the count as he still listened and now what a dying cadence this is surely something more than mortal that is what they say my lord said the valet they say it is nothing mortal that utters it and if i might say my thoughts peace said the count and he listened till the strain died away this is strange said he as he turned from the window close the casements pierre pierre obeyed and the count soon after dismissed him but did not so soon lose the remembrance of the music which long vibrated in his fancy in tones of melting sweetness while surprise and perplexity engaged his thoughts ludovico meanwhile in his remote chamber heard now and then the faint echo of a closing door as the family retired to rest and then the hall clock at a great distance strike twelve it is midnight said he and he looked suspiciously round the spacious chamber the fire on the hearth was now nearly expiring for his attention having been engaged by the book before him he had forgotten everything besides but he soon added fresh wood not because he was cold though the night was stormy but because he was cheerless and having again trimmed his lamp he poured out a glass of wine drew his chair nearer to the crackling blaze tried to be deaf to the wind that howled mournfully at the casements endeavoured to abstract his mind from the melancholy that was stealing upon him and again took up his book it had been lent to him by dorothy who had formerly picked it up in an obscure corner of the marquis library and who having opened it and perceived some of the marvels it related had carefully preserved it for her own entertainment its condition giving her some excuse for detaining it from its proper station the damp corner into which it had fallen had caused the cover to be disfigured and mouldy and the leaves to be so discolored with spots that it was not without difficulty the letters could be traced the fictions of the provencal writers whether drawn from the arabian legends brought by the saracens into spain 
or recounting the chivalric exploits performed by the crusaders whom the traubaders accompanied to the east were generally splendid and always marvellous both in scenery and incident and it was not wonderful that dorothy and lodovico should be fascinated by inventions which had captivated the careless imagination in every rank of society in a former age some of the tales however in the book now before ludovico were of simple structure and exhibited nothing of the magnificent machinery and heroic manners which usually characterized the fables of the twelfth century and of this description was the one he now happened to open which in its original style was of great length but which may be thus shortly related the reader will perceive that it is strongly tinctured with the superstition of the times the provencal tale there lived in the province of beratagne a noble baron famous for his magnificence and courtly hospitalities his castle was graced with ladies of exquisite beauty and thronged with illustrious knights for the honour he paid to feats of chivalry invited the brave of distant countries to enter his lights and his court was more splendid than those of many princes eight minstrels were retained in his service who used to sing to their harps romantic fictions taken from the arabians or adventures of chivalry that befell knights during the crusades or the martial deeds of the baron their lord while he surrounded by his knights and ladies banqueted in the great hall of his castle where the costly tapestry that adorned the walls with pictured exploits of his ancestors the casements of painted glass enriched with armorial bearings the gorgeous banners that waved along the roof the sumptuous canopies the profusion of gold and silver that glittered on the sideboards the numerous dishes that covered the tables the number and gay liveries of the attendants with the chivalric and splendid attire of the guests united to form a scene of magnificence such as we may not hope to see in these degenerate days of the baron the following adventure is related one night having retired late from the banquet to his chamber and dismissed his attendants he was surprised by the appearance of a stranger of a noble air but of a sorrowful and dejected countenance believing that this person had been secreted in the apartment since it appeared impossible he could have lately passed the ante-room unobserved by the pages in waiting who would have prevented this intrusion on their lord the baron calling loudly for his people drew his sword which he had not yet taken from his side and stood upon his defence the stranger slowly advancing told him that there was nothing to fear that he came with no hostile design but to communicate to him a terrible secret which it was necessary for him to know the baron appeased by the courteous manners of the stranger after surveying him for some time in silence returned his sword into the scabbard and desired him to explain the means by which he had obtained access to the chamber and the purpose of this extraordinary visit without answering either of these inquiries the stranger said that he could not then explain himself but that if the baron would follow him to the edge of the forest at a short distance from the castle walls he would there convince him that he had something of importance to disclose this proposal again alarmed the baron who could scarcely believe that the stranger meant to draw him to so solitary a spot at this hour of the night without harboring a design against his life and he refused to go observing at the same time that if the stranger's purpose was an honourable one he would not persist in refusing to reveal the occasion of his visit in the apartment where they were while he spoke this he viewed the stranger still more attentively than before but observed no change in his countenance or any symptom that might intimate a consciousness of evil design he was habited like a knight and was of a tall and majestic stature and of dignified and courteous manners still however he refused to communicate the subject of his errand in any place but that he had mentioned and at the same time gave hints concerning the secret he would disclose that awakened a degree of solemn curiosity in the baron which at length induced him to consent to follow the stranger on certain conditions sir knight said he i will attend you to the forest and will take with me only four of my people who shall witness our conference to this however the knight objected 
"'What I would disclose,' said he, with solemnity, "'is to you alone. "'There are only three living persons to whom the circumstance is known. "'It is of more consequence to you and your house than I shall now explain. "'In future years you will look back to this night "'with satisfaction or repentance accordingly as you now determine. "'As you would hereafter prosper, follow me. "'I pledge you the honour of a night that no evil shall befall you. If you are contented to dare futurity, remain in your chamber, and I will depart as I came. Sir Knight, replied the Baron, how is it possible that my future peace can depend upon my present determination? That is not now to be told, said the stranger. I have explained myself to the utmost. It is late. If you follow me, it must be quickly. You will do well to consider the alternative." The baron mused, and as he looked upon the knight, he perceived his countenance assume a singular solemnity. Here Ludovico thought he heard a noise, and he threw a glance round the chamber, and then held up the lamp to assist his observation. But not perceiving anything to confirm his alarm, he took up the book again and pursued the story. The baron paced his apartment for some time in silence, impressed by the last words of the stranger whose extraordinary request he feared to grant, and feared also to refuse. At length he said, Sir Knight, you are utterly unknown to me. Tell me yourself, is it reasonable that I should trust myself alone with a stranger at this hour in a solitary forest? Tell me at least who you are, and who assisted to secrete you in this chamber. The knight frowned at these latter words, and was a moment silent. Then, with a countenance somewhat stern, he said, I am an English knight, I am called Sir Bevis of Lancaster, and my deeds are not unknown to the holy city, whence I was returning to my native land when I was benighted in the neighbouring forest. Your name is not unknown to fame, said the baron. I have heard of it. The knight looked haughtily. But why, since my castle is known to entertain all true knights, did not your herald announce you? Why did you not appear at the banquet, where your presence would have been welcomed? instead of hiding yourself in my castle and stealing to my chamber at midnight. The stranger frowned and turned away in silence, but the baron repeated the questions. I come not, said the knight, to answer inquiries, but to reveal facts. If you would know more, follow me, and again I pledge the honour of a knight that you shall return in safety. Be quick in your determination. I must be gone. After some further hesitation, the baron determined to follow the stranger, and to see the result of his extraordinary request. He therefore again drew forth his sword, and taking up a lamp, bade the knight lead on. The latter obeyed, and opening the door of the chamber, they passed into the ante-room, where the baron, surprised to find all his pages asleep, stopped, and with hasty violence was going to reprimand them for their carelessness, when the knight waved his hand, and looked so expressively upon the baron, that the latter restrained his resentment and passed on the knight having descended a staircase opened a secret door which the baron had believed was known only to himself and proceeding through several narrow and winding passages came at length to a small gate that opened beyond the walls of the castle meanwhile the baron followed in silence and amazement on perceiving that these secret passages were so well known to a stranger and felt inclined to return from an adventure that appeared to partake of treachery as well as danger. Then, considering that he was armed, and observing the courteous and noble air of his conductor, his courage returned, he blushed that it had failed him for a moment, and he resolved to trace the mystery to its source. He now found himself on the heathy platform before the great gates of his castle, where, on looking up, he perceived lights glimmering in the different casements of the guests, who were retiring to sleep and while he shivered in the blast and looked on the dark and desolate scene around him he thought of the comforts of his warm chamber rendered cheerfully by the blaze of wood and felt for a moment the full contrast of his present situation here ludovico paused a moment and looking at his own fire gave it a brightening stir the wind was strong and the baron watched his lamp with anxiety expecting every moment to see it extinguished but though the flame wavered it did not expire and he still followed the stranger who often sighed as he went but did not speak when they reached the borders of the forest 
The knight turned and raised his head as if he meant to address the baron, but then, closing his lips in silence, he walked on. As they entered beneath the dark and spreading boughs, the baron, affected by the solemnity of the scene, hesitated whether to proceed and demanded how much further they were to go. The knight replied only by a gesture, and the baron, with hesitating steps and a suspicious eye, followed through an obscure and intricate path till having proceeded a considerable way he again demanded whither they were going and refused to proceed unless he was informed as he said this he looked at his own sword and at the knight alternately who shook his head and whose dejected countenance disarmed the baron for a moment of suspicion a little further is the place whither i would lead you said the stranger no evil shall befall you i have sworn it on the honour of a knight the baron, reassured, again followed in silence, and they soon arrived at a deep recess of the forest, where the dark and lofty chestnuts entirely excluded the sky, and which was so overgrown with underwood that they proceeded with difficulty. The knight sighed deeply as he passed, and sometimes paused, and having at length reached a spot where the trees crowded into a knot, he turned and with a terrific look, pointing to the ground, the baron saw there the body of a man, stretched at its length and weltering in blood a ghastly wound was on the forehead and death appeared already to have contracted the features the baron on perceiving the spectacle started in horror looked at the knight for explanation and was then going to raise the body and examine if there were yet any remains of life but the stranger waving his hand fixed upon him a look so earnest and mournful as not only much surprised him but made him desist but what were the baron's emotions when on holding the lamp near the features of the corpse he discovered the exact resemblance of the stranger his conductor to whom he now looked up in astonishment and inquiry as he gazed he perceived the countenance of the knight change and begin to fade till his whole form gradually vanished from his astonished sense while the baron stood fixed to a spot a voice was heard to utter these words Ludovico started and laid down the book, for he thought he heard a voice in the chamber, and he looked toward the bed, where, however, he saw only the dark curtains and the pall. He listened, scarcely daring to draw his breath, but heard only the distant roaring of the sea in the storm, and the blast that rushed by the casements, when, concluding that he had been deceived by its sighings, he took up his book to finish the story. While the baron stood fixed to the spot, a voice was heard to utter these words. The body of Sir Bevis of Lancaster, a noble knight of England, lies before you. He was this knight, waylaid and murdered, as he journeyed from the holy city towards his native land. Respect the honour of knighthood and the law of humanity. Inter the body in Christian ground, and cause his murderers to be punished. As ye observe or neglect this, shall peace and happiness, or war and misery, light upon you and your house for ever. The baron, when he recovered from the awe and astonishment into which this adventure had thrown him, returned to his castle, whither he caused the body of Sir Bevis to be removed, and on the following day it was interred with the honours of knighthood, in the chapel of the castle, attended by all the noble knights and ladies who graced the court of Baron de Brunet. Ludovico, having finished this story, laid aside the book, for he felt drowsy, and after putting more wood on the fire and taking another glass of wine, he reposed himself in the armchair on the hearth. In his dream he still beheld the chamber where he really was, and once or twice started from imperfect slumbers, imagining he saw a man's face looking over the high back of his armchair. This idea had so strongly impressed him, that when he raised his eyes, he almost expected to meet other eyes, fixed upon his own, and he quitted his seat and looked behind the chair, before he felt perfectly convinced that no person was there. Thus closed the hour. End of Volume 4, Chapter 6